Hi, and welcome to The Fader Uncovered with me, Mark Ronson. I just want to remind you that this interview is in two parts, so if you haven't listened to part one, please go do that now. I'm Mark Ronson, and this is The Fader Uncovered podcast. In this interview series, I'll be speaking with some of the most influential and groundbreaking musicians in the world, from genre-defining stars to avant-garde trailblazers, about their lives and careers. Each episode will be rooted in these musicians' iconic Fader cover stories, an institution that over the past two decades has told artists' stories like no other. The podcast is a chance for us to talk about the past, present, and future, reflecting on their breakthroughs, diving into their lives when their covers hit shelves, and discussing what the future might hold now. And it's an opportunity for me to speak to some of the artists I most admire. This is The Fader Uncovered with Mark Bronson. At the end of part one, we touched on a Kanye quote that really struck me when he referred to the Pharrell and Neptune sound as gospel punk. I even took to the keys to dissect the chord sequences of tunes like Drop It Like It's Hot and You Don't Have to Call just to show how gospel influenced they are. But the punk side of things cannot be overlooked either. Punk can be a lot of things, attitude, aggression, feel, but in the case of the Neptunes, it's musical, and it's a real signature of their sound. The half step is a musical term for when you go up one note on the chromatic scale. When you do it in single notes, it sort of sounds like Jaws. When you play it in chords, it sounds like punk, it's atonal, it's non-musical, yet somehow miraculously the Neptunes managed to make it the foundation of some of the biggest pop records of all time. Hella good. Justin Timberlake. Passa Cavassier. Lap dance. In fact, I don't think anyone else has ever managed to make so much out of so little, to somehow craft iconic melodies, beats, and hooks over such nasty, I mean that in a good way, punk-influenced chord structures. It's what made their music actually so damn tough, this ballsy atonality that laid the foundation for these pop bangers. I really have no idea what inspired it, but I've always been so impressed by it. I thought I might venture the theory that it had something to do with Chad and Pharrell's close proximity to the DC area and the 930 Club, essentially the mecca of East Coast punk music. So let us venture in right there. I had never really thought about that, and I guess because I'm just thinking of that Kanye quote, but like the punk part, I had never thought because obviously DC is thought of as this mecca for punk, and DC is pretty close to Virginia Beach and stuff. Was any of that punk sort of 930 club type stuff an influence on you or did you did it filter down somehow dude the funny thing is the 930 club was the place where you know people like bad brains would play like no bullshit and then like trouble funk would play the next night so literally When you hear them saying, we're going to drop the bomb on the white boy crew. Drop the bomb, drop the bomb. We're going to drop the bomb. Let them know it. That, that, they're talking about the punk guys. Right. Isn't that right. crazy? That is crazy. And, and by the way, to anybody that's listening that has never heard of Trouble Funk, you have to hear Drop the Bomb. It's the most alien, space, African really from another fucking planet, genius, really fucking genius, genius, genius shit ever. Meanwhile, Bad Brains is fucking, you know, like HR and those guys are fucking genius. Like that whole world, like. It's crazy actually when you say, when you talk about Trouble Funk and and Go Go and stuff. I mean, obviously I hear the influencer and stuff that you've done. Certain people, I guess Wale, people from D.C. have tried to champion it, but I don't know if there's ever been a a music that's so vibrant in this one place that just doesn't 
seem to travel out, right? Is it because it's such a specific rhythm or it's about the club or the venue or the dancing? I Listen, I've never been able to crack the case. Like, okay, Bustin' Loose really was a big record. Right. That was a True. legitimate big record. That was yeah. huge. And shout to Chuck Brown and the Soul Searchers. And there was another record. I think his name is DJ Cool. Uh, ooh, ah, ooh, ah, ah. Oh, yeah, ooh, of course. Ah, right. That was right. big. DJ Cool. And uh, Let Me Clear My Throat, which wasn't really go-go, but right. it was still him. We got to give it to him. And he had, a, he had one called The Water Dance that was pretty big, too. Okay. This ain't the water. Well, the water dance was a big one. Yeah. And then there was the butt with EU. I mean, we look at it a little different, you know what I'm saying? But you got to yeah. give you got to give it its credit and Spike Lee, thank you to him for like pushing that record. But I mean, and it's changed and evolved so much since then. Wale, I don't know, man, this might have been like eight years ago, nine years ago, 10 years ago. Wale, we went to D.C. I don't know what we was out there for, but I'll never forget him, Stephen Hill, and they they took us to, um, I forget what club this was, but TCB was there. Mm-hmm. And they played this record called Bait. And oh my goodness. Have you ever heard that record? No, I don't know this record. Oh man, it's old now, but you gotta okay. listen to it. It's called, the, yeah. the name of the group is called TCB. The, the song is called Bait. It is, it's still, I listen to it probably once a year just because I just want to, I want my mind to be blown. You know what? Yeah. Honestly, it's like watching Avatar. Bait should have been playing on, on Pandora. Like when you saw right. the people, you need to see fucking, like, it's I'm fucking my, it as soon as we get off. It's so good. That's amazing. Yeah, Wale, I've heard him, but TCB, like he obviously mentions it a lot. Um, okay, so if we could get into the NERD stuff now, because this was, I guess, the same transition period. Was there always, there was always going to be a band or was NERD even first, the group concept, and then the Neptunes take it off? I'm not sure about the exact chronology there. Well, we were the Neptunes as a group. Right. And then Chad and I were the producers of the group. And then, you know, we had a deal. We were signed to, Teddy got us a deal. We were signed to Michael Jackson, MJJ Records. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah. And then we lost the deal. And then uh, we signed it. It just never, nothing really happened after that. Yeah. And we were kind of like waiting around and me being young Aries and pompous and arrogant, I just, you know, I shot off at the mouth. So we parted ways. It was all good. I didn't think anything. I didn't know what what was going to happen, but I was young and impatient. And, you know, we were the Neptunes. And at that point, I had written Teddy's verse for Rump Shaker and only written. I didn't produce it. People think I produced it, but I didn't. I had only written his verse for um, Rump Shaker. And Chad and I produced um, Tonight's The Night for Black Street. But that was it. And it was like, we didn't think anything else was going to happen. So on the side, we were still producing, but still using the name Neptunes. And we were, you know, producing songs. And finally, when we got an opportunity, because we were like going around, like shopping us as a, as a group and it, it just wasn't happening. I was eccentric and a clear fucking weirdo at that time. So people didn't really understand what was walking in their office or what they were listening to because it was so fucking bizarre in comparison to the conveyor belt and the point of entry at that time was just so narrow. And so, when Keith from Virgin, who had signed Khalees, approached us and he was like, you know, you guys should make an album. I was like, what? He's like, yeah, you make an album. And at that point, we were already making records for people. You know what I'm saying? Like Nori. And so it's like, we didn't want to disturb what we had already become as producers, which was just like the Neptunes. So then that's when we came up with No One Ever Really Dies. Because I wanted to like make the word nerd cool. Yeah. Even though no one is two words. Right. No word. Yeah. Um, that's kind of wild that they said that because you weren't especially even on the hooks yet. Like, got your money, Nori, these kind of things. Like, no one even knew you were a singer or a natural front man. Did Keith have some idea that you had that in you? Or he would just, like, love the music and just believed in, in the group? Yeah. He, he got it. He got it. He got it. And so did um, Ashley and Ray. Yeah. 
you know, and Nancy. That was Barry. an amazing time. That Virgin Records. It was like I feel like it was like the last thing before like the bottom fell out of the industry. You know, before we slowly got it back. But it was like there were these English label heads that were just like signed cool left field shit that also just happened to be the biggest shit whether it was like blur spice girls like smashing it internationally they had you guys i was i had made that record for nika costa their parties around grammy times were like the most excessive wild shit because like that was their whole thing like here you need a million dollars you need a million dollars nelly hooper you need a million dollars like that was kind of a very very special maybe never happen again era but they had they did at the end of the day with people like Keith and Ashley find great shit. And like you, they were way ahead of the curve the way they saw the NERD stuff. Like really saw it, you know, really, really, really saw it. It was insane. And that whole Virgin Records like roster, we were so like blessed to be a part of that. My favorite episode of The Simpsons is in the ninth season, when The Simpsons visit New York City. In one scene, Bart happens by accident by the office of Mad Magazine and very excitedly asks the receptionist if he can have a peek inside, to which she says, kid, I know you probably think there's some wacky, amazing stuff going on back there, but really it's just an office. There's nothing to see. And just at that moment, as he's about to turn and walk off dejectedly, the door cracks open for a moment and he sees Alfred E. Newman, Spy vs. Spy, and all the other wacky, amazing, mad magazine shit you could dream of. That's pretty much how I felt going up to record company offices in the late 90s. As a DJ, you had to go around these record labels to pick up promotional copies of the latest 12 inches, the hot singles that weren't in the store yet. Just going up to the old bad boy office, I once got on the elevator, pressed the button, and just as the door was about to close, Biggie and Faith stepped in. I stood there, of course, frozen in complete awe. Another time, also at Bad Boy, I was waiting in reception and I got a peek through the main door, Bart style, and caught a glimpse of Puffy in a big office getting a haircut. All these things I saw in my early 20s at these labels made them seem larger than life. And they were. All these labels had identities. Tommy Boy, Bad Boy, Loud Records. They were exciting. And unlike these labels that were all indies, Virgin Records was a major label, but with the spirit of an indie. Sure, there were tons of desks and cubicles, but everyone who worked there was super cool and laid back. Plus, because most of the money behind the label was in the UK, a lot of the higher-ups were English and cool and maybe a little more music-centric. I mean, think of the roster at the time. It was Chemical Brothers, Soul to Soul, Spice Girls, Daft Punk, Janet, Massive Attack, D'Angelo, Blur, Lenny Kravitz. More on him shortly. Plus, in true Brit fashion, when it came to partying, they liked to cane it. Their Grammy parties were epic, the stuff of legend. And I used to be up there hanging in those offices because my first real production gig was co-producing the debut album of Virgin artist Nika Costa. It was fun times. The last days of Rome almost, because pretty soon file sharing would decimate all these labels, people would be fired, the mood went dour, and there was no more crazy money for these fun times. But I am very lucky I got to experience that time, that kind of spark and flash and creativity that could foster a group like Chad and Pharrell's N.E.R.D. And now, a quick break. Janet was there, you know, D'Angelo was there. Lenny. Lenny Kravitz was there. Yeah, yeah. Basement Jacks. Wild. You know, it was crazy. Daft Punk. Daft Punk, fuck, of course. And I was thinking about Lenny because he's on a couple of the tracks on that NERD record. And I was like, here's a guy. Listen, he doesn't need me telling him anything. He's got plenty of rock star excess and money and, and acclaim and sales and this thing. But like, here's a guy that I think doesn't get his full credit or gets written off a little bit because like before the Dap Kings, before what I did with what we did with Amy, all this stuff, like he had found a way to like make drums and recording sound raw as fuck, like the early 70s and was doing it like cool as fuck, like in 86 or 87 or whatever. Like for some reason, I just feel like he gets he he doesn't quite get the credit he he deserves, Lenny. No, you know, he doesn't because, well, first of all, he's a brilliant Gemini and his songs and his style, you, you know, I think most people don't really 
they probably don't have the bandwidth for all the stuff that he deserves. That's a compliment to him. All the yeah. credit that he deserves, like most people don't really have the bandwidth. Like you gotta be a super fan to really, really, really give that man all of his flowers. Yeah. You know, he could play every instrument, you know, wrote all those songs, continues to write great songs, an amazing touring act. I mean, his live, like going to a Lenny concert is a whole other like experience for people. And he's yeah. been doing it for years. And everything yeah. that he did, it was just always the best shit, you know? Yeah, like, Are You Gonna Go My Way is maybe like one of the most unconventional sort of pop hits, right? Because mm -hmm. it's, just, it's just like a stomping fucking rock song. His riffs and his vocals, all that shit. No, really, really fucking special. I, I, and he is a black man. Right, yes. Right, when you think about like where rock and roll really comes from, like most people really don't know where it comes from. They don't know that no. like those are black artists. That's true. And a lot of their records were being taken and re-recorded. Yeah. And, you know, and it was virtually reversed, right? All this time. And then here he comes. And he's like the real thing. And he shreds when he plays, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's like super, it's wild. And he did it like not once or twice and not a couple of times. Like he just consistently did it, you know? That's big yeah. bro. I saw him in concert like two or three years ago at like some giant German festival or somewhere in the middle of Europe when you're just looking at a field and it's like he's playing to 50,000 people and just what he is internationally as a thing is obviously so potent and you see it when you go around the world, like what he means to people, but also just like, it just fucking rocks. Like, you know, I don't know if the German people, are, maybe it was Dutch, I, but it was just like, it was a sea of 50,000 white faces, but they were losing their mind for yes. this man who plays all these records they love. Yes. Yes. No, he's, he really is the king to me. So uh, the NERD, the first record, you've talked about it a lot. It was originally more of an electronic record. Mm -hmm. And then you decided to cut it with this band. And obviously because of that, it did end up with more of a rock leaning energy because it was live. What was the reason? Did you not like the first version or did it not, was it not doing what you wanted it to do? Because K-Rock wouldn't play our music. Was it literally that? Yeah. Oh, you took the record, it was finished and you started, you were actually taking it around to market it. Yeah. Wow. They were like, yo, this is like a, I don't know, I forget what they called it. But it's not rock and roll at all. I'm like, all right. So, you know, me being like, and it was crazy. But Ashley and Ray were crazy enough to say, okay, here's the budget, go do it. Wow. And it ended up paying off. It sure did. It, but did you know that you needed to be marketed to as a K-Rock? You're like, okay, well, we're not going to get on the hot 97s of the world. We are a left-leaning act, so we actually need... To, you knew that that was the audience, like alt-college, K-Rock, like yeah. when you were making that record. Yes. We knew that, like, we didn't have a shot. And we tried, you know? We had a... She Wants to Move remix that played on Hot 97. Like, people were being supportive. They would have been way more supportive today. But, you know, though, again, everything was like all siloed. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but now it's different. Now it's different. I used to love playing Run to the Sun. Because even the other records, Things Can Only Get Better, I guess those were the slightly more R&B or like less aggressive records. But like run to the sun to play that out of like keep rising to the top or something that was like in that perfect zone of like classic i don't know classic r&b in my, in my set at that point mm -hmm. thank you so when that record comes out and you suddenly have all this um on a much smaller level i made my first record for electra all i'm thinking about is I want to have a hit in New York in the clubs because that's where I live and that's the only place I go and this is my world, this tiny area. And so when it didn't do well at all in New York and it started to really blow up in England and Japan and these places, it was kind of like blew my mind a little bit because I was like, wait, here are these places I like wasn't even thinking about when I made this record, but I love these places and these places have cool music taste and I, and I, I love it. I'm enjoying this, that someone gets and appreciates it. What was the feeling with the NERD record when it came out and you definitely like, you had that fucking crazy UK, Japan, all this international thing. Was it kind of exciting? It was very exciting because they treated us different, you know? They like totally got it, 
Totally got it. Asia, Europe, they got us. That's when my love affair for Asia started. Yeah. There's something about England, and uh, I always think about it. There's a smaller country. There's one radio station, certainly that time. Zane Lowe plays your record at 9 p.m., and the whole country hears it. Like, But there's also something... It's a little less genre specific. Do you know what I mean? Like you could mm-hmm. have lap dance, you could have rock star. People aren't like looking at you going like, we don't know where to put this. Yeah, no, cause they just like different shit. And then it's funny you say that cause like as a DJ, cause I really didn't have my first hit records as a producer till much later. So like, I always think of myself in terms of the Neptune stuff as like what I played. And it's every record, it's funny you say she wants to move didn't feel like a, whatever, a hip-hop record or a Hot 97 record, but I felt like it was. Like, I felt like those songs went off it really off in clubs, and I felt like with every NERG record, there was always one song that, like, at least that, like, DJs couldn't wait to, like, get their hands on. Everyone knows that was definitely more embracing the Baltimore club shit. And then I forgot, like, fucking... Like, I still play Lemon. Like, literally, le- like three nights ago like it's so crazy to think that that was a 2017 NERD record because yeah I don't know why it just feels fucking fresh I mean it's only four years ago (laughs) I was already a big big fan of the Neptune's electronic sound so I wasn't quite sure what to think when I first heard the NERD record with the live drums the drums were also kind of big and roomy rocky even they weren't breakbeat type hip-hop drums also being someone who came from a rock background myself playing in bands who had then got into hip-hop i was hypersensitive to people putting big rock guitars and drums over hip-hop records which was a bit of a trend of the time you had diddy and jimmy page and the benjamin's rock remix with dave Grohl. if it wasn't right it could be whack but with nerd it was so unexpected and kind of not too perfect so it was also endearing now listening to the original NERD record without the live drums, it sounds kind of crazy. Like it was definitely always supposed to be live. Rockstar loses all the wallop of the almost over now, almost over now part. And even the lovely R&B tunes like Run to the Sun and Things Are Getting Better lose the charm and quirkiness. So even if the reason for recording all these guitars and drums was at the request of the label wanting them to get on radio, it was a good thing if you consider the end result. For every 50 dumb record company ideas, there can be a good one. I mean, there are A&R people that I love and trust and always enjoy going to for their feedback. Shout out to Peter Edge. And you can incorporate their opinions, but you still have to execute your own vision at the end of the day. Okay, so this is actually a beautiful quote that you said. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'll paraphrase it. In the the Kanye interview as well, and you said... um, You're talking about, I think, maybe longevity in general. And you said, like, you know, what we're doing is, like, the industry sort of makes you think that there's a certain age that you have. And that's the only age, parentheses, bracket that you have to really smash it. And after that, kind of played out, whatever it is, you're not, your ideas aren't valid. And you said, we're just fishermen really casting our net out to sea. And sometimes something comes back and sometimes things don't. And I think that I think that that's a little modest because I don't think all fishermen are maybe created equal. But I also think that you have to have that wherewithal and patience to sort of withstand those moments. Because, I mean, I feel like your longevity is just because of those things. Like you wait it out. You're like, and then you smash it for a thing. And then you'll make some cool shit that'll be left field. And then you'll smash it again. And I feel like maybe most people... Maybe they don't have the confidence to sort of come back or just once you're done, people stop checking for you. Well, I, I don't like to get in the way. I like to pop up, like you say, disrupt the whole shit and then poof, be gone. Yeah. And just do that periodically. I would do it on a more consistent basis if I felt like the matrix could handle it, you know, but I don't like wasting things. So I like to go, okay, sit quiet. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then poof, I do. I'm gone. Because I don't like to get in the way. Right. 
I think that there's something, it, it is weird, and, and obviously Quincy is as much of a disruptor and an outlier just because he's from a generation we look up to and revere and seems classic. It doesn't mean that he wasn't wildly original when he came out, but I guess he was 44 or 45 when he made Thriller. And I think in pop music, you're allowed to be older. Max Martin, you just sort of like, and rock music and these things, Mutt Lang, these people that are older, but... Hip hop and R and B, even though it really is essentially pop music at this point, is so it is so age centric or something. Is there like a mentality? Obviously, your thing is ageless anyway, and I feel like you still obviously keep yourself excited and change tempos and sounds and palettes and things like that. But why do you think hip hop is almost like dog years? Like you have such a shorter space to make it. Think of the great producers who have come up. I'm not going to name names since so we're lo alongside you on those big records. Jay, whoever. Like, it's very unforgiving in that way. Um, because rap music is very connected to the time. It's very connected to that. So depending on where you are when you're making that music, where you are in your life, and what your age is, at a certain point, you just evolve and you either evolve with it and lead it. But at a certain point, you take your eye off it for one second and the next thing you know, you're chasing for the rest of your life. And kids can hear that. Yes. They, they can hear when you're chasing. They can hear when you ain't really, when you don't really live it and you ain't really in it like that. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know who is a scary, scary, scary guy when it comes to this shit? It's Lil John. Right. Lil John did turn down for what? You hear him on there, so you're like, okay, cool. But you got to understand how long he's been doing this shit. People don't realize Lil John did blow the whistle. I did not know that. Leave him alone. Right. He's different. Yeah. Like he's one of the ones. Yeah. You know who else is timeless like that? T Pain. Timeless. T Pain not yeah. only can sing his ass off, but he be producing too. And writing. And literally, he got that record with um, Kehlani. I mean, just one of many. Certain people, when they really understand that about themselves, they don't trip. They just do it. They just make music. And if you find out, you find out. Their royalty statements definitely <laughs> are very clear about it. You know, but yeah, man. Like, and, and, and there's a couple. There's a couple of people who are like that. And just like really, like you see, yay, yay still producing. And honestly, like if you look at his last album, like he's, he got it. Not still yeah. got it, but he got it. You know, like it ain't no steal, like he, he really got it. He really knows how to like put that work in and really go in that, in that diamond mine and bring out raw material. He knows how to do that. And I think it's just when you get out of it, that's when you're in trouble. Cause then when you want to get back to it, you chasing after it. Now, does getting out of it just mean like sort of getting out of the zeitgeist so you're not in touch or you just actually stop practicing your art every day? Yeah, you got to stay in and experimenting. You have to stay in and experiment every day. If not every day, but, you know, whatever your speed is. Some people work a couple times a week. I don't know. For me, it's like every day. I've walked into the studio like once or twice when you've been working and I'm always kind of like... Like, you really are on it. You're, like, there chopping the fucking kicks and stairs and putting it around like like I would expect you to be. There, I've always had this theory, like, I wonder if there's something about that that is a young... There's a part of a younger person's brain, like, there's something... Not to equate it with video games, but the part that loves being in front of a fucking NPC, chopping up drums, like truncating a snare, like all these things, like is there also, I've always wondered if there's something about that that is partly like, I don't want to say young man's game because it could be young man, young woman, whoever, but there's something like in that part of the brain and to keep doing it, you're sort of defying. Could be. Could be that that's what it is. I think for me, I'm more of like a pattern sleuth <laughs> and <laughs> chord progression sleuth than I am anything else. Yeah. I love that. That's like yeah. what still warms my soul. I have this theory. I, I think arguably you, Kanye, Andre, well, outcasts, let's be fair. 
are the th probably the three most influential uh, uh, this is my thoughts i can't really say this is like an absolute but you yay andre big boy i uh, have this special place so i think that, like a lot of anything that's happened that's been progressive in music a uh, you would chat have has been this filter down that's really like enveloped all of music and and kind of just changed how shit is and in some ways you've all cited q-tip as your favorite at some point in time. And we're not literally turning it, although I love that time when Q-Tip was on your show. It was a really lovely thing when he was on your Apple show. But um, there's something wild, isn't there? Isn't it wild that like the three, that's sort of Mount Rushmore of, of now, and then there's Tip like above it, who, who maybe has not had the same, I don't even want to say success because that's not true. Everybody who knows loves this shit, but maybe just like the commercial, whatever it is. But Tip is like, is he Zeus? Tip is Zeus. Yeah, it's kind of crazy when the three most important all like say like that's our guy. Nah, one hundred percent. Ain't no getting around it. I'm sorry, that man made lyrics to go. <laughs> There's a funny moment when Q-Tip is the guest on Pharrell's Other Tone radio show, and Pharrell is giving Q-Tip his due and really praising him in a very genuine way, and Tip being very modest and a gracious guest, but not really one for being fawned over, says something to the effect of, well, if I'm the genius, then why does my bank account look the way it does and yours looks the way that it does? He's sort of playfully teasing Pharrell, but it's also an interesting point. Q-Tip has sold millions of records and is incredibly celebrated, but he also came in an early era where slightly left field, more musical hip hop was not guaranteed the worldwide multi-platinum status. What he did do was break the game open for those who followed and by the sheer brilliance of his output and just the fucking Q-tipness of it all, inspired and influenced some of the most brilliant from the next gen. So when one of your faves, be it Kanye, Andre, or Pharrell says, this guy's the GOAT, the one who changed their life, well, isn't he the guy then? Don't all roads somehow lead back there? I mean, throw on any of the first three Tribe records or the last one, they are classic, timeless, mind-expanding, soul-repairing albums. Pharrell felt the very same way. Him, you know, him and, you know, Ali, listen, that man made Bonita Apple Bomb. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. And to anyone that's never listened to that song, please go change your life. Go listen to that song and, and your life will change because you'll be like, what am I listening to? Yeah. I mean, the synesthesia was on nine trillion when I first heard that. Nine trillion. Yellows, greens, and pinks. Yeah. I still see those colors today when I hear that song. Incredible. I want to just say this one more time. I'm so grateful. Obviously, I'm grateful to God first and foremost, but I'm so grateful to Q-Tip because when I was a kid, I used to always like listen to music and like there are certain sections of a song that I really liked and I didn't know what a bridge was. That wasn't like common, like vernacular. We weren't walking around in Atlantis apartments talking about like bridges and shit. Right. Or changes or hooks. Like I didn't know any of the music industry or like I said, vernacular. But come to find out it was the bridges that I always loved. Stevie Wonder bridges and Earth, Wind and Fire changes and stuff. And when I first heard Benita Applebaum, I was sure that he had found that part and made it go over and over again. I didn't even know what looping was. All I knew is that I spent every day listening to that on a Sony CD Walkman, by the way. Yeah. Never ever dreaming that I would ever have like a licensing agreement with Sony like I do now. Not even knowing that they even had a label. Just like completely just green to the whole situation. Yeah. And when I heard that song... I remember thinking how subliminal I felt like the song was because I literally would like be in a trance of a light, very light trance of like nothing could disturb me. And that feeling is what made me really, really, really fall in love beyond my natural love for music and appreciation for music. It made me want to understand how that was happening. That's what started me on my journey for like making music. Because I was like, yeah. what in the fuck have these guys done? What are they doing? 
And why does it make me do this? Why does it make me feel this way? And every girl- How old I, were you? I want to say like 13, 14 years old. I might've been like 14, 15. I remember thinking, I don't know what this is, but this is amazing. And literally any girlfriend that I'm dating has to listen to this song with me on the fucking phone. <laughs> and this is, this, this, is, this is the way it's going down. This is what's happening. And those guys created a whole like world of like black, essentially black beatniks. Yeah. You know? So anyways, thank you. Thank you for your time. Oh yeah. It's funny you said about the girlfriend thing because my wife now, she, when she looks at me every now and then, she'll just be like, she's a little younger than me. So I take for granted that she would know any of this stuff. And she just goes like, do I love you? Do I adore you? And it makes me love her even more that we share oh. this thing oh. as well of that same language and song. It's amazing. Ah, oh, come on. It doesn't get any better than that. Yeah. I mean, and by the way, footprints, man, fucking footprints. Yeah. You know, I'm, listen, I know. when I heard that, and that, that to me was like dark blue and purple footprints was like what the fuck well like what made them first of all where did they find that from now come to find out it's Donald Bird but what made them like when you hear it on loop I'm like you guys people can yeah. like I don't know you could damn near get a fucking operation without any kind of anesthesia if you just listen to that fucking song uh -huh. Like, I remember playing that at a Q-tip party, DJing, and I and it was like obviously already the vibrant era. And he came up to me in the booth. He's like, "Yo, do you mind stop playing my shit from like before '91?" Because I think in the sweet way it was like just like, "All right, he sounds he sounds super young to him or something." But I remember playing Footprints and him coming up and being like, "Dude, you know, I hate when he does that. He doesn't understand. You gotta just oh, just let us appreciate." one day in my lifetime, one day in my lifetime, there's like 10 songs that I got to, that I feel like I got to make something that makes me feel like that. And that's one of them. Yeah. One day I will. One day I'll be good enough. One day. I think you probably made some, but certainly who did that to other people. Definitely. No, no, no. I got, I'm telling you, Footprints is one of them ones, but listen, thank you, man. <laughs> of Appreciate course. You. No, thanks for doing this. It's great. And uh, I hope to see you sometime soon and look forward to more music. Same here, and, uh, and and you as well. And also, um, thank you to The Fader. It's like Chad and I's first cover ever. Yeah. We're grateful. Amazing cover. Great, right, bro. Footprints is a really special record, starting with a one-bar loop of the Sir Duke horn line. Ba -na, ba -na, with this weird stomp under it into the Donald Byrd Think Twice loop, and then the Public Enemy drums come in on the verse. It's layered and soulful and eccentric in a way that would definitely blow your mind as a 14-year-old in a bedroom in Virginia. I also think Pharrell is being a little too modest when he says he hasn't made anything that extraordinary. As a member of the Neptunes and as a soloist, he's made generational records. Records that have rocked the rawest underground clubs that somehow will also get your grandma up at a wedding. He's pushed everything forward and we live in a better world because of his music. So salute Pharrell. Take me out with the fader. Thanks again to Pharrell Williams for taking the time to talk with us. A special fader thank you to our Grammy and Oscar Award winning host, Mark Ronson. Please visit thefader.com slash podcasts to read the original cover story and check out a playlist of artists mentioned in this episode. If you like the show, please share it and review us on your favorite podcast app. Please join us next Monday to find out which of your favorite artists will be uncovered next. Executive producers Rob Stone and John Cohen for the Fader Podcast Network. Talent booking Robert English. Producers Alex Robert Ross and Maddie Russell Shapiro. Directed by Daniel Nevetta and produced by the Fader in association with byt.nyc. Engineered and mixed by David Rogers Barry. Theme music by DJ Premier. For Fader Uncovered merchandise, please visit shop.thefader.com. Thanks, and see you next week.